Hey, what's going on YouTube? Thank you for checking out this video. If you guys are new, my name is Antoine, and today we're going to go over uh, the presentation that Ron Coleman, Dr. Ron Coleman, gave yesterday at the Sacramento Aquarium Society. A little bit about Ron. He is a professor over at Sacramento State College. He's a long-standing member of the Sacramento Aquarium Society, and he has a plethora of knowledge when it comes to fish in general. But his love is cichlids, specifically cichlids from uh, the Central American region. Uh, in the video, he states that he's been to Costa Rica over 35 times, um, and m a lot of his students uh, take trips down there as well to document and to study the behavior and habitats uh, of these fish. So, without further ado, let's check this video out on the presentation that Ron gave to us yesterday. And quickly, just wanted to say thank you, Ron, for all your hard work and all the time that you spend uh, to educate us and just bring bring a light to the to the fish of this region. Thank you, Ron. Rican fishes, and I was asked a, a while ago to give this talk and particularly to focus on the convict cichlid. And I'm talking about the convict cichlids and their relatives, and I have better video of some of their relatives. This is one of their relatives. This is called Septum fasciatus. And I just want you to see as I'm going through some of the other stuff, keep this in mind. They're just wonderfully interesting fish. They're relatively small, very much a fish you can keep in a tank. And what you're seeing right here is a boy and a girl that are courting. And so this is the, this is the boy over there. And the girl is uh, over here. And she is trying to look for a spot where she might make a nest. And this is you can see all this kind of stuff in your tank. It's just beautiful, wonderful, interesting kind of things. And they get some of these incredible colors. The convict that I'll talk mostly about doesn't get quite as much color, but the same idea. Okay, I'll do that one. And then I want to do this one. And partly it's because I can't get the video to work inside the presentation, so I'm showing you the video now. Um, this is the same fish. They change color when they got kids. And it goes a little blurry here. But I want you to see what they look like when they're actually doing their parental care. And for a lot of people that keep cichlids, it's all about the parenting because it's just wonderful to watch. And so we'll get to see them as, as they come into view. So here's, oh, there we go. I'm underwater here. Come on. There we go. There we've got the one. And if, can, if, can you see the little babies schooling around in there? This is what they do this in your tank actually faster than you would imagine. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the boy and the girl, I mean, there's the boy and they're the girl, and they're just working, the male and female, working back and forth, uh, taking care of, of these kids. And it's, it's, it's this thing, not so much the colors, but it's the behavior that just makes them really, really interesting. Okay, so that's the preamble. Let's see, there we go. Okay. God, how's the, how big is that for male? He would be about... Three inches. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm about this far from him underwater with my camera. They really don't care. They're just like, whatever, just don't eat the kids. So, okay. So, okay. Just let me see if I can get this to start. All right. Slideshow from beginning. And then I have to do a special something here. And it should work. All right. Question. Yes. If you were that far from a lake underwater, does that mean you were inside the fish tank? It's in a river. I'm, I'm in a river. That was, that was in the wild in Costa Rica. How big are they? The fishes are about that big. And they don't seem to mind that I'm right there. Isn't that cool? But why are they that big? Wait, why are they, I thought they were bigger. No, no. That's the, they're not very big. <laughs> so uh, today what I'm going to talk about is uh, Costa Rican cichlids looking for clues. And this particular version of it is about the convict cichlid and friends. So this is the convict cichlid right now. When I do that, do you see that at all? Or is it just, it just bouncing off the ceiling? Okay, so you can see that one. Okay, so, and I'm a professor at uh, California, uh, at uh, California State University, Sacramento. So let's, uh, let's proceed here. So this talk is hopefully going to have a little something for everyone, something for the beginner and something for the advanced. It actually starts more with the advanced, but after this. So what is a cichlid? Because a lot of you don't keep cichlids. Maybe you, maybe you could. Those who are just getting in, get another tank, get some cichlids. Uh, if you're going to get cichlids, I suggest this one. There's a bag right up over here. See, right here. You can start today, right there. They haven't bred yet. Give them a few minutes. 
Okay, so what is a cichlid? It's a large group of, uh, of fishes, a large family. There's somewhere around uh, 1,700 species. We just keep discovering more of them, lots and lots of them. We don't know how old this group is, but the estimates are at least something about 45 million years. So they've been around for a long time, a lot longer than many people think. And somewhere around 20 million years ago, they split into the old world ones and the new world ones. So up here, you'll see a bunch of, of cichlids from East Africa and West Africa. Those are what we call the old world cichlids. And then there's Central and South America, which are the new world ones. Yes? Are they living in dinosaurs and stuff? That's a very good question. That we don't know. The dinosaurs ended about 65 million years ago. So it was right about the edge that they appeared. So very interesting. So we've got the old world and the new world. And then what I want to do now is give you a little bit of a framework. There's no test. I know I'm a professor and it's exam season, but there's no test. Just hold on for a second. And um, I want you to give you a bit of a framework so you understand where these convicts are. Okay, so um, there's a bunch of lineages in the Americas. So within the Americas, there's a bunch of different groups, a lot of work trying to figure out how these are related. So there's things like harrowing cichlids. That's what we're going to talk about those. Pike cichlids, some of you have seen these long predatory, um, you would like to eat all the other cichlids. Uh, a, a, a pistogramma, a little dwarf guys, which we get in here, beautiful little tiny ones, South American. And peacock bass, great big, big predator kind of things. So there's a lot of different lineages with, in there. Within the what's called harrowing cichlids, about 124 are found in what's called Mesoamerica, so central lower uh, Central America, okay? So, uh, and we're going to talk about all of them. No. <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, people go through the whole batch, we're not. I just wanted you to, to get a picture, and I didn't take this. Um, Oldrich Rican is another scientist, a Czech scientist. He put this together. It's a beautiful sort of display of there's just colors and shapes and sizes. This is just this heroin cichlids. There's just there's, there's, there's one whatever you like. If you like green ones, there's green ones. You want red ones, there's red ones. You want red and green? Well, there's red and green ones. There's all sorts of different shapes and sizes and, and a lot of work trying to figure this stuff out. Because the interesting thing is that Central America is actually not that big. You know, South America is really big. Central America is not that big. You can go across it in a few hours. So why, why so many different fishes? That's the interesting thing. And I am not going to go through all of those cichlids, but there's lots of books available for those of us old timers who like books. Uh, you can find some of these. Uh, and of course, there's just tons of stuff on the internet. Um, it will help you a little bit if you sort of keep in mind what I'm talking about here, if you're ever looking for one, because one of the challenges as we understand more about these fishes, their names change. They change like every week. <laughs> it's just like, oh, name of the week. Some of them, uh, it, it, even as, as a professional in the field, I can't even keep track of the changes. So of the 124 species of cichlids in Mesoamerica, the best one is the convict cichlid. Uh -huh. Why would their names change every week? Or if the first name is supposed to be with a one usually? Well, because uh, the names change, it's a good question. As we uh, understand more about the relationships, the names have to reflect those. And so certain parts of the name can change and certain parts can't. And so um, that is a challenge. The very second part of the name, what's called the specific epithet, that almost always stays the same. So that's your best bet. So septum fasciatus has been septum fasciatus for 100 years. But whether it was Hero septum fasciatus or Cyclosoma septum fasciatus or uh, Herichthys, that's changed all the time. Okay, so here's the best one, and I'm a bit biased. They're, they're a wonderful little fish. And so what is a convict cichlid? To figure out how they all go together, and this changes all the time as we learn a lot more, and it's changed a lot in the last 10 years as we do a lot of molecular biology. So lots changed there. So we got this whole big thing. We're not going to look at all that. We're going to take a chunk of it from here to here, which is this, which is, again, way too big for what we're going to talk about. And then within that little chunk, there's a little part here. And this is where we're going to focus. And we're not even going to do all of that. So what we're looking at here is this guy right here, Nigra fasciatus. That's the convict cichlid. And it has, uh, it has some cousins. 
It's got a fish called uh, Sahika, show you a little bit about that. I'm not going to show you anything about Nanoluteus, and it's got Myrnae and Septum fasciatus. This is the little group, they all kind of, that same little body, and they're all great aquarium fish. There are other Central American cichlids, which are not great aquarium fish, to get too big. These guys are good. Uh huh. So that's what that's showing is how they're related or how we understand them to be related. I realize it's it's a that is exactly right. That's why you got a sticker. Okay. So here's what we've got. We're going to focus on this guy right here. So you don't have to. The rest you can just let go if you don't care. If if you are interested. I, I can give you the, the latest paper on how all of this goes together. It's a beautiful paper that really works it out. So this is our, our main focus here, but we're also going to talk about some of these other guys, which are the ones right next to it. And so these are some of the next ones, just so you know. This is a thing called septum fasciatus. Our lab spends a lot of time uh, in the field studying that fish. And it doesn't really show here. Does it show? Can you see the blue? Very they have a beautiful blue uh, on, in some populations. Others are black. Interesting. Can we get more lights off, maybe? One more, a little bit. That's a little better. Okay. Oh, and they went, and they, they came back. They're, they're down, down a little bit. Yeah. That, that, that's fine. Keep it, keep it low. That. Oh, it's a light show. That's good. Okay. <laughs> so we've got this septum fasciatus, and there's this Myrna thing, which you can't really see the difference. It looks a lot the same, but it's actually, she's sitting in the same pose. She actually is a little bit different. We'll talk a little bit more about her. And then this other... 35. 35? 35 up here. And then there's this other one, Sahika, okay, which is also sort of looks the same. It's called the T-bar cichlid. You see it's got this bar up here. So a relatively small, nice aquarium fish. So where are they found? Where are you going to find these things? Well, Central America. So here we are. There's North America up here, South America. So we're talking this kind of zone here. Uh, I work a lot in Costa Rica, which is right down here. And so here's Costa Rica. There's the, uh, the capital, San Jose. Has anyone been? Put it on your list. It's a great country. It's a great country. I've been there, I don't know, 35 times, I guess, now. So it's just a, a wonderful country. I go back every year. Um, and it's, it's just a beautiful place and wonderful people. So what this is trying to show you is the, the, the relatives of the convicts. So you just get a little bit of the idea of, of, of how these things are distributed. So here's Costa Rica, and this one is Myrna. So the one is found just over here in a little pocket in, in the far southeast. And then septum fasciatus is found here in the northeast. So you see how there's this one, and then there's like this one, and there's like a funny little spot where there isn't anything in between. There's a mountain ridge that runs down the middle, and you find Sahika over here. So this is sort of how we would expect. Each spot has its own kind of little thing closely related. Probably uh, were, well, they were very close related in the past. Okay, so now let's see where the convict is. The convict doesn't follow any of those rules. The convict is found all over the top, and the more we go, the more we find it. Now, the, the challenge with the convict is that it's very possible people move them. <laughs> you know, you get one, put it in a bucket, and drive a little ways, and then drop it off on the farm or something like that. So we're not entirely sure if it's always been here, but we know it has been right across the top historically. So it is a fish that does well in a lot of different places. And that's why they do so well in your tanks. All they really, really need is water. And not even that much of it. <laughs> so so um, this is what their water looks like in the wild. So they are occur in big rivers, but they're not in the middle of the rivers. They're not in the fast flowing stuff. They're around the edges, these very beautiful tropical rivers and streams. That would be great convict habitat down here. This is beautiful convict habitat right along the edge here. That's what they're kind of looking for. They're looking for logs and little spaces. And so to keep that in mind when you're setting up your convict tank, which I hope you'll do right after this talk, okay? So what I'm going to tell you about is, is how I set up convict tanks for what we do. So the best place to find a convict 
is in your aquarium. They're great aquarium fish. They really are. It's a great fish for people just getting into the hobby. You get to see how to take care of a fish, and you get to see the whole reproduction and parental care, the whole, the whole bit in a relatively short time. So um, convicts is an aquarium fish. The, the writing didn't come out very large here. I've, I've learned a lesson here. Uh, pros, they're not too hard to get. They're relatively inexpensive. If you're paying more than like $8 for a convict, you're paying too much, okay? You shouldn't be that much. Um, they're not fussy about water. Um, they're easy to breed, usually within a few weeks. And uh, you get to see the fabulous, the picture of what's going on. Cons, okay, look at this. It's, it's hard to read, but it says, so what does it say here? It says, once they start breeding, they are very, very protective of their offspring, which is a nice way of saying that they will kill all your other fish. <laughs> okay. And they're always breeding. And they're always breeding. So, they're, always breeding. so they're, not, they're not a good community tank. Please do not get a pair of convicts and put them in with those really expensive tetras that you just purchased. They, they just won't last. Okay, They just won't. And um, if it's not today, it'll be tomorrow. This is what this is what convicts do. It's not that they're nasty. They just want to get everything away from their kids. Everything. Okay? So the, the best possible tank mates are rocks. Okay? <laughs> okay. Now, I do have a tank at home. And um, as my wife was on the watch, that we've got convicts in. It's about a 90-gallon tank. And there's a bunch of other fish in there. That's enough space that the convicts can do their thing. But even then, I, I look in that tank every day to see if any of them are breeding because they could take over that whole end of the tank and cause a lot of problems. Yes, Eleanor? What about plants? We're going we're to get to that. Okay, that's a very good question. So how to set up a convict that could aquarium? Some of this applies to any fish tank, but some of it is rather particular for something like a convict cichlid. And that's why uh, Eric originally asked me to give this talk. So you've got two choices. You got really two, well, there's probably others, but there's really two choices. Um, one is what I call the functional breeding tank. This is what we do at work. We just want to breed the fish, keep them alive, see the parental care, do all the experiments we're going to talk about. Th that's what we're doing. You may or may not want that. It's, it's cheaper, it's easy to set up. You could go the natural looking tank. Uh, it's more expensive, nicer looking, okay? So we'll, we'll, I'll show you some examples of each that I, I made just for this talk. So here is the functional breeding tank as viewed from the front. What have you got in there? You've got, um, so for Eleanor, there are our plastic plants, okay? You could put live plants in there. They, they won't necessarily clobber them, but the interesting thing is where these fish are found, there are no live plants under the water. So um, if you want to make a beautifully aquascape tank with the convicts working their way through the weeds, you can do it. But that's not how they live, okay? It's uh, your choice, okay? N nor do they live in plastic plants. So it doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> so what we want is we want a tank that the fish will live in, and I'll tell you why these are so important. So you got a little sponge filter in there, a flower pot, a heater, that kind of thing. Some other stuff we'll talk about in a second. Here's what it looks like from above. And this is actually really important if you're setting up a, a, a convict cichlid or, or, or fish like it tank. It's arranged in a particular way. I've got the filter at the back, and I've, I've used these plants to kind of create a kind of a wall to divide up the space. You want to have a space near the pot, and then you want to have a divided up space so that the other fish, which is almost always the female, can get away and hide. Absolutely critical. If you put all your plants around the outside and make sort of, when I was first got into the hobby, I remember the old uh, um, um, Tetra books, you know, all those how to set up an aquarium, and they would set up everything up as a sort of a, like a, 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 sort of like a fence around the outside. Yes? You mean, you said hide. You mean hide or just get out of the line? Like Both. And often hide, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so if, if the, the books will tell you to just set up the, the, the tanks around the, 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 the plants and stuff around the outside to create a sort of a, I don't know, it's almost like a theater thing where the fish could play in the middle. That's beautiful for tetras. Terrible for these kind of fish. You'll end up with one of them, for almost for sure. Okay, so you want to divide up the space. 
Now, here is a natural tank that I made just for you guys. Um, it's not as bright as I'd like it to be, but what this is, no plants, no plants at all. Okay, this is using the kinds of things that you would find with this fish in the wild. Chunks of wood, so this is wood here. Rocks, I didn't put a flower pot in here for them to spawn in, but I guarantee you, if you set up this tank, you wanna add some water to it, they'll spawn right in there. They're looking for a cave. Two rocks like this, they're like, that's great. They might, if they're feeling really bold, spawn up here, but that's a little bit exposed. They really want to be tucked away. So they'll be in here. And if you've got a pair in there and things aren't going perfectly, as often happens when you get to put a pair of fish together, there's lots of places for somebody to go behind, go over here. And then I put in some almond leaves. Their natural environment has lots of dead leaves just all over the place. There could be a plant, but it's only a plant that fell into the river and is yet to rot. It's just, that's, it's just, there's nothing rooted there. There's algae, that's it. Okay, this is what it looks like from above. So there's that little cave right there. You see, a fish could hide over here, over there, behind there. Lots of spaces. Spaces is everything when keeping these fish. So we'll get back to that. Okay, so some choices matter when you're setting up a tank like this, and some don't. And some of them are a little bit surprising. So things that matter. Tank size, specifically the bottom area. Very critical. Um, background absolutely you need a background doesn't matter what it is but you need one uh, kind of filtration that can actually be really important for a reason you probably don't imagine and structure lots things that do not matter lighting they don't care they literally you could not have any light at all they would wouldn't bother them at all um, gravel size doesn't matter to these fish at all and things that might matter is temperature so tell you a little bit about these things and a little bit about why I know these things, because that's what we do, is we do the science to try and figure these things out. So here's, so let's set up a tank. We've got a bunch of stuff. You've been to the auction or you, <laughs> whatever, and you got a bunch of stuff. And so let's, let's put it all together and see how we're going to make a convict cyclic tank. So how big of a tank do you need? I love the 20 long for a fish like this. It's, so we get lots of them. I have probably about 120 of them in the lab. I have 170 tanks in total, so about 120 of them are these. Great, great tanks. And the reason is it's got a lot of bottom area and not that much height. For fish like this, it's all about bottom area. This is a five-gallon tank. Putting a fish, well, a, one convict would be fine in there, two in there. It's not going to work. It's not going to work for very long. I have spawned convicts in 10-gallon tanks, but uh, the odds of it working are very low. And why I say, why wouldn't it work? The male's going to kill the female. That's just what's going to happen. And, and the other way almost never, almost never. It's, uh, it was, it's, it's, we'll see why. Ask that question a little bit later. Uh, it's one of these beautiful tanks for a beta or something like that, and, so, and shrimp, these little two-gallon tanks, not something that you would want to keep a, a convict in for a long period of time. It's just not going to work. Um, interestingly, like I said, it, it's the bottom area. So this tank here... And this tank, a little bit warped in the picture, they have the same bottom area. This one's a little sort of squarish, and this is, as far as the convicts are concerned, these tanks are the same size, even though this one's actually twice as tall. They don't care. They're, they're not going up there. They don't, it, it adds more water, but it really doesn't help the fish, and it's not going to help you. And in many ways, this would be a, a much harder tank to work with with these fish than something like this, a sort of a longer, skinnier tank. So that's something to keep in keep in mind. Um, background. I have not done the experiment on this. Where is Brad? This is a good experiment. Brad's one of my students. Um, backgrounds are critical for cichlids. You can put something that you like, like plants or something like that. In the lab, we use this uh, um, plastic uh, table cover stuff you get at the party places. You can get like 5,000 feet for 40 bucks. And, we, you, you know, you just, and you put it on the back. It, the whole point of it is, I'm not sure quite what the fish is thinking, but they, they realize that the world ends there. Wherever that is, that's the end of the world. And they don't have to worry about something coming from behind that. That's why the background is so important. If you have it open, so you can see the tank from all sides, 
they really are vulnerable all the time. And if you watch the fish, how they behave, they'll, they'll be constantly going to the middle, trying to like, I wonder if somebody's coming from over there, or somebody over here, or somebody over there. If there's a background of any kind, they can hide in the corners. So something to think about. So we put backgrounds on all three backsides. Just, that's just something to consider. So that's far more important than you'd think. Now, this is much more expensive than this. And you could, as I did in that other one, I actually drew, painted the background. You could do that too, your chance to be artistic. Um, okay, filters. Millions of kinds of filters. I have one of, at least one of each of them. Because whenever a new filter comes out, I buy one and try it and whatever. For, for something like the, these convict cichlids, really, this is your best bed. You know, this is a sponge filter. It's not because it keeps the water cleaner, although they're really, really good at that. The problem comes later on, which is about two and a half weeks after your convict cichlids start breeding. And what will happen is they have these little babies. Well, any of these waterfall types, and I've had dozens, if not hundreds of those, you want to keep those away from any fish that has little babies because what happens? They, they get sucked up the thing. Even those, and Rich Byerly isn't here, um, even the little old box filters with the cotton in them, it's sad. I've, I've seen whole families. What will happen is the, the parents will go, oh, there's, there's a cool piece of structure, and they go over, and then, and then the mom's outside, and all the babies are inside the filter, and you've got to take it apart, and, the, and they go right back in. So it, it's, it doesn't hurt them. These ones will hurt them. They get kind of, I love these internal ones. They're actually not made. They're by real. They're not made anymore. Everything I love is not made anymore. They, are, they clean a tank like you wouldn't believe, but they will suck up little baby fish. And, and some of these big guys, they can clean a whole school of fry out in, in seconds. So you want to be careful on that. Um, these guys are relatively small fish, so you don't need, you know, 900 gallons per hour of filtration on a convict tank. I, I dare say, sometimes I have no filters on a tank. Yes? You could do that. You could do that. But then I think, why not just put the sponge filter in? The beauty of sponge filters is they're so easy to clean. So if you've not experienced this, what it is, it's a sponge. The air comes down here. It goes up the tube, which draws water. The water comes in through this foam. Don't make your own with just foam that you got from an old couch. It's a different kind of foam. And yeah, it doesn't work. It's, it's, uh, your couch is closed cell foam. This is open cell foam. You can buy it in chunks, but, but don't just go get some foam at the foam store. And, and this draws in the, uh, the material from the water. The interesting thing, it's, it's not even the mechanical drawing in the fish crap. How it works is it's, there's so much surface area on here you get just tons of bacteria growing in there, and it's the bacteria that are keeping it clean. They're just great, and you know, with 170 tanks, it's a lot to, to, to maintain between myself and my students. You take this thing out, you rinse it under the, the, the sink, and you're, you're back in business in two minutes. You don't have to rinse it in special water. You don't have to rinse it in, in tank water. You can rinse it. I rinse it in lukewarm water because I don't like my hands getting cold. But other than that, just rinse it, put it back in, you're good to go on to the next one. So I, I highly encourage this kind of filter. And the babies will eat little bits of food off of the filter. So that's a win-win. Not going to kill them, and it's good for them. So that's why that's important. Structure is everything, as I've said before. So I had lots of structure here in the natural tank with wood and leaves and rock and stuff like that. In the functional tank... Uh, some plastic plants that works fine, okay? So why is this so important? Oh, you can get green plastic plants if you want. I tend to go with the green, but you can get purple, you can get blue, you can put fluorescent pink. The convicts don't care. They really don't care. They're not seeing this as something they're going to eat. They're seeing it as, they're seeing it as something they're going to live in and around you put away in the corner in the in the cupboard yes you could use those the convicts will like them okay so why do i know that structure is important i've told you a bunch of stuff so how do i know this stuff we do experiments i don't expect you to read this what i'm showing you is that there was a particular student involved here this is anthony barley who by the way has just became a professor at arizona state which makes me kind of proud he did this when he was a student and what he was interested in 
is saying, well, people have said structure is important. So how important is it? And what he did is, you can see very vaguely over here, we had two tanks. We had a tank that had a little bit of structure, and we had a tank that had a lot of structure. And then what Anthony did is he sat there with a little clicker and watched very, very carefully for periods of time and watched how much chasing went on in each of these two treatments. Now, the interesting thing was he had a pair of fish in here. He then added the structure. So it's the same fish, the same tank, and everything. He just put the structure in or took the structure out. So we, for those who are into experiments, we controlled for everything. What's your number? Joe. Joe, right there. So, um, so what happened? Well, here's what happened. And this is what would happen in your tank. If you had a tank with very little structure, so it's basically wide open, how much chasing is going to happen? Each line represents one pair of fish when it was subjected to having a little bit of structure or when we just added a whole bunch of structure. Do you see how much the, the chasing dropped? Some of them we did the other way. We started with them with a lot of structure and then took it away and now they're chasing each other all over the place. So it really does work. We've done this quite a few times here that that structure really important. Uh huh. Is the way to get no chasing? Yeah, sorry? Is there a way to get no chasing with all that grass? If you put in a real ton of stuff, you can get no chasings. The problem with putting in a ton of rocks and plants and that is then you don't see your fish at all. <laughs> which, um, you know, you're like, oh, I've got all these wonderful fish. They're great. <laughs> I had this catfish once. I, I had it for 23 years. I saw him like four times in 23 years. So it's like, so he lives a long time, but he makes an appearance like every three years or so. So you got to decide what you want to do. Um, breeding pots. This is, uh, that's, see, Ellen and I planted to ask these questions. Um, they, they lay their eggs in caves in the wild. Now, you could make caves out of rocks. The easiest way that we make caves is out of a flower pot with the, the bottom knocked out. It, it's easiest for us to see the eggs. We can count the eggs, take pictures of them. You just lie it on the side, and 99 out of 100 times, they will lay their eggs on the, up on the ceiling, like right there at what I would call uh, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. It's almost every time that they, they lay them there. Now, if you want to make a cave that is natural, this is the way to go. Okay, that's they love this. They're like, oh, this is fantastic. It's a whole cave experience. And they go in, but of course, what happens? You don't see them. You don't know whether they've laid eggs. You know, all that happens is eventually they'll come out of the pot with their little kids and you've missed all the other cool things. So these work really well for a convict. It's the um, three and a half inch flower pot is just, you know, you just get them. And, and sometimes if you go to a, a, a nursery or something, uh, they'll even have a bunch of broken ones that they can't sell. You're like, I can use that, like, whatever. Just take the broken ones. Like, yes, that's great. I, <laughs> then you break the heart. You say, I was just going to break your ones anyway. So, like, <laughs> really? We tried not to break them, and you're going to smash them. You, oh, how you do that? You take a large screwdriver and a hammer, and you hit it. And actually, the bottom comes out. You get quite good at it. So, okay, gravel, they don't, they don't care. It just uh, little or, or big. I try not to use really, really fine gravel because it gets hard to clean. So something that's my hand. So it's, you know, that kind of stuff is fine. Bigger is fine too. Um, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's not that important to them. In, in fact, in many places where they, they live, there's no gravel at all. It's just rock. So nets. Now this is my pet peeve. <laughs> and I'm sorry if I offend anyone. Every time I go to a fish store <laughs> and I want to get a fish, let's say it's a new person. They get this little teeny, teeny, tiny net, and they chase the fish for like an hour and a half around the tank. It's like, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Get a big net, catch all the fish, pull out the ones you want. And it's, it's much less stressful on the fish. They don't want to be chased. They don't know when you stop chasing. Maybe you're going to come back later and chase them again. Try not to chase them too much. Get a nice big net and catch them. And it's okay to handle these fish. As long as your hands are wet, You'd be amazed what you can do with a conversation. You can pick them out, you put them on the table, we measure them all the time. We do all sorts of things. Uh -huh. Using two nets, to sandwich them is even quicker. Yeah, you just, and there you go. And it's, it's like, and you're done. And it's actually, after a while, some of the fish that we measure a lot, they get very used to it. It's like, oh, catching time, measuring time, going back, go back. It just doesn't seem to bother them much. Okay, pet peeve time. Now, something that you might consider getting 
Um, you could have a separate tank for in case of issues, but that's actually less good. Um, I love these things. They were made by Loose Star. Uh, and of course, since it's a product I love, Loose Star closed their business and you can't get them anymore. So uh, it's, a, it's a, what we call the net breeder box. They do make these uh, very fine net ones. Those are not going to work well for convicts because they chew their way through them. They just like chew and they're like, uh, he's like, oh, that was fun. What's the next puzzle? I'm like, oh, that just cost me $10. Please don't do that. Um, these ones, Marina makes these. It's a solid plastic box. That's pretty good. They're more expensive. There's some that even have a little motor. You don't need that little pump. What you want to do here, why you have this, is to keep the fish in the tank. These are penalty boxes, <laughs> okay? So if you have a boy and a girl, and the boy is chasing the girl too much, he needs a timeout. And you catch him, and you put him in this, and he can sit there staring at the other fish and going, well, the error of my ways. And they do seem to learn a little bit. And what it does also is it gives the other fish a chance to recover, maybe grow some scales back, grow some tail fin back, and most importantly, to really explore all the nooks and crannies of that tank so that if they need to know, they know exactly where they can go to get into where the other fish can't get them. So that's why in some ways it's better to do this than to take that fish entirely out of the context and bring it back. It's, that's more disruptive. So it's kind of like, yeah, I, I don't know if they really think about how bad they've been, but <laughs> do your kids, I mean, really, when they're in the court, do they? I don't know. Eleanor? Time out. Do you really think about the error of your ways? Not really. No. Okay. <laughs> Only once. That's good. Lighting. In most cases, the fish do not care. Too much lighting can be a challenge for fishes like cichlids. And the reason is they don't occur in the middle parts of big, bright rivers. Any guesses why? Big fish and birds. Kingfishers nail them. So they're like, they feel really exposed if it's really, really bright. They're like, oh, there's something coming from someplace, okay? Which is actually why when I work underwater in the tropics, if you stand over the fish, they get very excited and nervous. But if you go in swimming with them, if you have a big tank, you try this at home. Rich buyer, they could try this. Um, they, they let you get very close because they can see the whole deal. It's that sort of what they're afraid of is herons, herons that come down from above and, you know, grab them from their world. So not, don't make it really, really bright. Um, this is another interesting thing. Because in the tropics, day length does not vary throughout the year, these fish are not sensitive to day length. So, you know, here it's spring now, so a lot of plants are like, oh, it's spring, you know, it must be the days are longer, we're going to do the, the flowering thing. It doesn't work that way in the tropics. The day is always the same length. So what that means is that um, there's, well, technical word, there's been no selection for them to be sensitive to day length. They just don't, they don't know, they don't care. It doesn't matter whether it's long or short or whatever. They will sleep at night. So if, you, if your room goes very, very dark, they will sleep at night. They don't have to sleep. I've never, in 40 years of doing this, I've never seen a fish say, I'm tired, I guess. I need a break. Um, and actually, I would be a bit cautious about making your room go really, really black. It would be better. Some of these LED lights have a sort of a blue mode um, because one of the ways that cichlids do get freaked out is if it goes from really uh, dark to really light, and their usual response is to jump. And I've had cichlids this big just they're like, whoa, and they, you know, they run into you, they, they take off. So better not to do that. Have a little night light in there so they get a little bit of light. Yes? The chill's off because they will chew his toes off. <laughs> yes, they will. So you don't have to worry about that with these. So um, a little bit of light is good, um, and the, the amount of light does not affect their breeding or not. Um, the light is really just for you. It's for you to see your fish. That, that's, you know, you can make the light whatever color you want. If that's what you like the fish to look like, that's, that's fine. Okay? So don't, don't try not to flip those lights on suddenly. Um, in our fish rooms, we have different banks of lights that go on staggered. So it kind of goes da-da-da-da, and then in the night it kind of da-da-da-da-da down. But there's still always a light in there. Okay. You need a thermometer. Or do you? <laughs> 
one of my another one of my sort of things. So you can buy all sorts of thermometers. Uh, we have very, very high grade thermometers. This one can do two tenths of a degree Celsius. It's about 60 bucks. You're like, I don't want to spend 60 bucks. I could buy some shrimp or some fish for that. Okay, and there's like your $30 one. Then you should like your $2.99 one, the floater job, okay? Uh, there's this one. I just got this the other day just to show you. It's a Fluval um, digital one, okay? And then there's like this one, which Penplax has been making for since I was a kid. And I love this thermometer. I'm going to show you why. So lots of different things to tell you the temperature. Well, how important is it that you know the temperature? Let's talk about that. So first of all, let's look at the device. This is the Penplax one, and I love this one. So it's a metal thermometer. It's got two little brackets here and here, and it's got a glass tube. But the cool thing is the metal brackets don't hold the glass tube very strongly. So if you would like your temperature to be different, you can just slide the glass tube up or down. <laughs> so for instance, here, I don't know if you can see it, this one I slid way up, and the temperature there is almost 30. Here I slid the, temp the thing down, and see it's only 21. I wanted it to be cooler. <laughs> it's, it's, you gotta be careful what, what, what you're getting, you know, when you, when you buy these things. You say, well, does it really even matter that much? So let's, let's, should I spend the money on this guy to, to know exactly that it's 23.2? Is that worth knowing? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> Don't. Save your money. Buy fish. Okay? And that's because for fish just like this, the temperature doesn't matter that much, uh, and it actually changes a lot. So let's, let's look at that. So what is the water temperature in the wild? I know this because I have spent, well, 35 trips, 30 years, um, and I'm seeing amount of money, <laughs> my wife, just, wife is still watching, uh, <laughs> trying to uh, see exactly what the world is like for these things. By measure, I have these very sophisticated temperature devices in rivers in, in Costa Rica, okay? And so this is what it looks like. This is what, what does it look like? So this is one year at one spot. It's a computer that's in the bottom of the river, and it's measuring the temperature every half hour. And what do you see? It goes up and down a lot, an awful lot. So this is sort of, we're going through a year here. So each one of these little blips is like a day. And here's degrees. It doesn't even matter what they are. I'll, I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit. So here, on a particular day, we go over here, which you can't read. I'm sorry about that. Uh, this is... Uh, 26 and a half Celsius, so that's 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 80 degrees. That, that was in the middle of the day. And then at night, it was 24. <laughs> so they don't care. <laughs> they just don't care that much. Now, I wouldn't put them down at uh, 19, okay? Although, I, a little side, I don't have a slide for this. We've been doing some interesting experiments. The young fish cannot handle really, really cold water. We've taken the eggs um, down to five, what's five Celsius? So um, 40, perfectly fine. You can, they develop it at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. No problems at all. So, and and we've, we've had them almost at 100. And they're fine. They're just fine. So some of these things, you know, you don't, don't spend all your time fiddling with uh, things to get it just perfectly because it doesn't matter to them, at least in terms of them staying alive. In one day, it can go hot and cold. This is in the same spot, hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold. Okay, so it's okay. Oh, relax here. And, and I, I hate it when people tell me to relax, but uh, relax. <laughs> it's okay if you do not know the exact temperature, and it's okay if your tank does not stay at the same temperature all the time. You should probably get a thermometer, but don't get the $60 one, okay? Does it even matter? Well, this is the other side. It can influence things. So, most fishes, including convicts, are cold-blooded. It's called the poikilotherm, meaning that the fish's body is the temperature of the water. And a bunch of things, like growth, development, reproduction, aggression, are all dependent, sorry, I'll, I'll move back. You don't have to, I'll move back over here, sorry. I'm just messing with the video thing. Um, 
just given up on you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, these things here are going to depend on temperature. And so you can decide what you want by the temperature. If you want fast growth, turn up the temperature. They'll grow much faster than at colder temperature. But you're also going to get some other things there which you may or may not want. Or at least we thought you would. So let's see if that actually works out. So in warmer water, your fish will grow faster. That's actually easy to show. They'll also eat more. So you can put more food in. And they're going to make more waste. We didn't measure that, but that's pretty obvious. If you do this, you're like, oh, cleaning that filter a lot. They will also be more aggressive. Will they? I'll show you that one. And uh, they're more inclined to breed at certain temperatures. But that's a little tricky. So how do we know these things? We do experiments. So this is another student. This was Nate and Nate. That's Nate and that's Nate. Um, they did this cool experiment where we took a bunch of uh, convicts, put them in some tanks, and then we would, again, look at things like their biting and this sort of stuff. And then we would change the temperature. And once it, we would take the same fish and take them from cold water to hot water the next day, to cold water the next day, hot water the next day. So they didn't bother them. It just changed their behavior. And so this is what it looks like. So each bar here, this pair of bars, like this right over here, this is, this is uh, fish number 12, okay? And the blue is when that fish was in cold water. They were actually biting a model is what they were doing. Uh, and this is when it was in hot water. Do you see the difference? <laughs> a, a lot, okay? It makes a lot of difference. So if you're wondering, why are my fish so aggressive? Have you got them in hot water? That'll do it, okay? And if you want to tune them down a little bit, you could consider taking that temperature down. Now, there are consequences to that, too. So that's we've done that a bunch of times with some various students. That's kind of a fun one. Now, those tears that didn't show... There's always, there's, whenever you do experiments, as you know, there's some that decide, I'm going to mess with you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I didn't read your instructions. <laughs> and I'm going to, yeah. Retesting with those pairs would, would be the same or would? Uh, hard to say. We don't retest. So we do a, a pair of fish one time and then we do a different one and a different one and a different one. So and that's an interesting question. How consistent is this? Yeah. Yeah. Eleanor? What was the very last one? Uh huh. The very last fish have more blue spikes than red bites. Yes, are you ever observant? It's pretty good. So why, why yes. does that happen? So, yeah, that's a really good question. Sometimes the fish don't uh, do what we want them to do. <laughs> and that's, but that tells you interesting things, that maybe something was going on here in this particular tank at that time. It could be that... Um, Someone, uh, a bunch of people have walked by the tank, and so the fish got very excited. That will, that will do things too. So that's why you have to do a whole bunch. But that is very. Everyone has the same amount of bite. Yeah, sometimes it's the same. So here's another thing that matters: is um, how long this reproduction thing, how often it happens, and how long it takes. So we do a lot of stuff with fish eggs. I'm not going to go into all that today, but we can take the eggs. Oh, by the way, you can take the eggs of these fish. You can take them out of the pot. You can take the pot out of the water. You can put it on the counter. You can boil water, have tea, make coffee. They're all fine. You don't have to be like running over here and running over there. You can scrape the eggs off of the pot and put them in other things. They're just amazingly resilient. So don't be afraid to try things. So we take these little eggs and we put them in these little cups and we put heaters in and we, we uh, put them at different temperatures. And, and I, I know some of you have seen this before, but what, what this shows is these are all brothers and sisters eggs. They're, they're all related. And we just put them at different temperatures. And you can see that if you put them at cold, so that's about 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 22 Celsius, it takes five days for them to hatch. If you take brothers and sisters laid at the same time and put them up here at 34, that's getting really, really warm, um, they hatch <coughs> in two days. So you can speed things up you could slow them down. And if you are planning to go away for the weekend and you don't want your fish to hatch, you can just turn it down a little bit. And you can, <laughs> so actually we've done this so many times with so many fish, I can tell you within 10 minutes, if I know when they laid and I know the egg size, I can tell you within 10 minutes when they will hatch. It's that precise. Does it affect the sex ratio? Yeah. On these convicts, no. no. But in some fish it does. The crebensis, it does. So these are all interesting things. Yes, Eleanor? Are those, are the, all the triangles like the babies or the eggs? Yeah. 
Yeah. So why is there two one. triangles like over there? Over there? At the top? Yeah. Oh, that's just a symbol. Sorry, that oh. and that's a spot. Oh. <laughs> that, that's just a symbol to say that each dot is a convex cyclic. Because I actually have a graph which has a whole bunch of other species on there, but I didn't want to share that. Uh, you're, you're catching the, the details there. Okay, so here's another one. So this temperature, which you may or may not record all that accurately, um, you may worry about it a little bit or not, does it really matter to the fish? They're going to grow faster in the warm water, be more aggressive. What do they really want? So this took a long time to get this to work. Uh, and this was a student, Bianca, uh, who did this for her master's. And so that's Bianca up there. And we're going to talk about this apparatus and this data. So this is the apparatus. This is version three. There was version one and two didn't work. But version three, what this is, is a long tank. It's about six feet long. Okay, so six feet, plexiglass. Um, it has barriers. See here? There's barriers, which are sort of solid, three-quarter inch plexi, but not quite. There's at the front corner, and I, I didn't put a close up right up here at the front of each of that barrier there's a little cutout and the cutout is big enough for a convict cichlid to swim from this chamber to this chamber to this chamber to this chamber the plexiglass is thick enough to insulate them so that if you put a chiller over here which is basically in the water refrigerator and crank it up full I wasn't paying for the electricity. And then you put three 300 watt heaters on this end and crank them up full, you can get 10 degrees Celsius across this thing. And they're each, each this, so this chamber might be 22 and this might be 24 and 26 and, and 30. And then we just put the pair of fish in. Now we put them not in, in one, like we I put the male down here and the female here so they all they have to swim through. They figure this thing out. It's like a little maze for them. It, it, five minutes. They're like, oh yeah, we just go through here, we get over there. We, uh, uh, and then they're like, oh, we like this one. Okay? And so this way we can actually ask them, if you had a choice, where would you prefer to spawn? And so here's what we've got. Each one of this, these are different pairs spawning. Um, these are the four choices that we gave that particular pair. So it had, this is in Celsius, 20, 26, so that's just below 80, 28, 30, 32. And the arrow indicates the one that they chose. You see that they decided 26 was too cold, but given a choice, they'd prefer the 28. The next pair, we shoved everything down in terms of heat, and so we had a 24, and, and they chose the 26. So we see there's, it's something in here, this one, uh, there, there, you see how we're dialing in? It's somewhere for convict cichlids. It's around 27, 28 degrees is what they really like. Now, if you don't give them a choice, they will spawn at 34. <laughs> They'll, I've spawned them at 20. You give them long enough, they're like, well, I guess this is what we're going to get. So we'll, <laughs> it's been four days, <laughs> and, and they will spawn. But... This is what they actually want, which is an interesting uh, issue. So, okay. Um, in your tank, you're probably not going to do the 300 watt heaters turned on full. You're going to buy heaters, okay? So, heaters, which heater to get? That is like the worst choice in aquarium keepers. It's just, I have, I have all of them. I have uh, tried every single one of them. And the sad truth is, None of them really, really work as advertised. You know, the, the, the digital ones that say they're going to record, to, they, they don't. And um, the cheap ones, well, I went through about 50 of these. They last about a year. And then your, your biggest problem with a heater is when it dies. Uh, some of them die by not going on. That's the best situation. <laughs> the worst is they die by only being on. And then you get fish soup. And so, you know, it, and it's a horrible thing. You go in and like, what's that smell? Oh boy. And there you can see they're just, they're floating. Uh, that's why I tend to go with lesser powered heaters so that if it sticks on, it rises up more slowly. You put a 300 watt heater in a 20 gallon tank and if something goes bad, it's just, you know, it's going to go bad very quickly. And another thing, which I, I went to get a slide of, but these ones, my favorite heaters are the Evo Jaegers, I guess they're now made by Eheim. Um, 
They have a little dial in the top which has numbers. Those numbers mean absolutely nothing. <laughs> absolutely nothing. Uh, all, well, th if it says 89, that means it's less than 91. But we've tested these. That, that, it doesn't mean it's 89. It could be 82. If you dial it up to, to like what it says is 89, well, now it's 84. So you really have to, you cannot trust these things. There's, and interestingly, in, in the thermometer thing, I had those little digital thermometers. You know, I had one of those. Those are the worst. Those things are basically random as to what temperature they'll tell you. We've tested bunches of them. They're like, it says it's 23, and I look at the real thermometer, it's 29. It's just, I mean, they just, I don't trust them. And it's the same technology that's in here. I wouldn't trust them. A, a good, what's called a thermistor, costs more than a few bucks. And it, you, you, you get what you pay for on this. So anyway, uh, the bottom line of heaters is they all break. Oh and I have probably five buckets of just heaters that I, I convince myself I'm going to repair them. <laughs> when you retire. When I retire. It hasn't happened yet. So they all break. Just watch your heaters. Okay. So breeding convicts. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me match. Does anyone know that? Or am I getting too old? Okay. Some of you know. Good. Okay. So um, how do you tell the boys from the girls? And I, I was making this last night. And I, I didn't, couldn't find a good picture of a boy. But, I, but this is a girl. The girls have uh, a little bit of blue and green up here, and they have orange on the side. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, not always. And so I had a student very interested in this. What we noticed, and anyone who's kept convicts or any kind of fish for a while, you get a feeling, right? You're like, yeah, it's a girl, isn't it? It's a girl. And I've worked with convicts for 40 years, like, hey, that, that's a girl. So I had a student <laughs> who was interested in this. This is Beth. And it's a very complex slide, but what we're doing here, don't worry about the details, it's called geometric morphometrics. And the idea is this, you take the fish, here's the fish, and you digitize the shape of it. And then you do some rather sophisticated math, and what you'll find is that the boys and the girls have slightly different shapes. And it's very interesting that the human eye seems to be able to pick this up without all this math. And, uh, and after all, you get really good at it. It's like, that's a girl. The girls have uh, a flatter forehead. The males have a little bit of a hump. And they, they carry their weight differently. The girls carry the weight more in the belly. And there's, there's a, a, a thing about their eyes are a little closer to the nose, which is what all of this shows. This is what's called the warp uh, um, matrix. And it shows that the boys and girls are just a little bit different. Okay, so that was interesting. It confirmed that we thought that you can actually tell them apart. There's a lot more that we're doing with that. And then we said, okay, um, do they care? Do these fish, do these boys and these girls care who they spawn with? And there's lots of ways of doing this. You could put two boys in a tank and put a girl and see who they spawn with. The trouble with that is, it might just be that the one boy's beating up the other boy, and you know, and that, so there's lots of problems with that. So we went all in, and this was uh, uh, two students, Kristen and uh, and Lindsay. And what they did is, uh, I'll show you an enlargement of this in a second. We took a tank about this big, and we put twenty convict cichlids in there. So let, oh, here it is, right here, twenty convict cichlids with all sorts of pots, and we put. Uh, little ones, little girls, and little boys, and big girls, and big boys, and medium, and whatever. And then as each pair would form, so let's say a pair decided they're going to take over this spot. The nice thing is the female will be right in there fanning the eggs. And then as soon as they hatch, that's when the male joins. And the both of them, with so many fish in there, they're really close on the net. And um, uh, Kristen actually developed the, the, cone, the, the cone of silence, which is just a, a bunch of... of um, plastic, which she would drop down over, and we could pull that pair out. So that pair is now gone, and then we take another two fish and put them in there. So it was always 20 fish, and we just do this over and over. If we, no, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Was sorry. Was like a tall, like, to-go fish, like a, you know, the, you go get some curry, and you have Yeah, like a tall thing, yeah, just so that we could very carefully close it down on them so that we knew we had that boy and that girl, and then we could scoop them out, 
put the pot back and do some more. And so here's what we found. So here on this axis is the size of the female, and here's the size of the male. And so, um, for instance, you'll notice here's the female, and she's 50 millimeters. So that's just a, a little, uh, this is her standard length, doesn't matter. This is the little one like this. And, oh, by the way, um, we have spawned female convicts as small as three quarters of an inch. Three quarters of an inch, yes, I know. Babies having babies, but anyway. So yeah, little t we've tried. We had for something. We had to show how many? How small can we get? The three quarters of an inch. Oh, and that reminds me. <laughs> I, I, I mentioned somewhere on Facebook, perhaps where I shouldn't have, um, that we are always in search of very large convict females. <laughs> no, no, we've got all, all of their big ones. Yeah, if, if anyone ever runs into or has a very large, I'm talking this big, like three inches plus female convicts, we really need those for something. We, it's good, they get to breed, but we need those. They're, they're hard, because that's a very big old female. Anyway, l let's look at one here. So she's 50, what does she like? Just below 70. But if she was 60, what does she like? Well, just below 80. The females are always choosing a male that's about a, a one and a half centimeters to two centimeters bigger than her. It's very interesting. The females are choosing. Yeah, it's it's not like the the, the small girls are saying, well, I'd really like to mate with the really biggest guy in the tank because he's the most macho dude in the whole world. That's not what they want. They want one that is... The males don't get a choice? Not, uh, well, it's a collaborative thing, but mostly it's the female that's choosing, yeah. So, so it's not that that there's some sort of ideal male, there is an ideal for her male, which is what's uh, a really what's called mate compatibility. It's something we work on. It's very, very interesting. It's not that there's some absolute standard of what is wonderful. Each female knows what's wonderful for her, which I think is very interesting. So that's what that shows. Okay. How many eggs are you going to get? Because you're going to sell these for $1,000 a piece, right? No, you're not. <laughs> you're going to try to give them away and put them in bags here. But just say, no, we've done this. This is why we need the big females. We're missing some points out here. We need some very, very big females to show that basically fecundity is how many eggs do they lay? Little females lay very small numbers of eggs, as, as few as like 25. And big females lay up around five or six hundred. Uh huh. So, Ron, you're looking for large females. Uh huh. But large fish, the older fish, do they yeah, sometimes what can happen is you can get a really big female that's um, she's big because she's actually enjoyed a very good life of lots of food, and so she's just um, she's heavy and and she's she might not even breed at all. So yeah, that's that's the thing we got. It. We want ones that have basically grown like a regular fish, but gone a long time. They don't get that big in the wild. They just don't get that big. So, uh huh. Egg. That's that's how many eggs, sorry. <coughs> so this was a female that was 10 grams and she laid 300 eggs. That's what each dot is. Isn't that interesting? And we spent a lot, a lot of time counting eggs. <laughs> a lot of time counting eggs. Is the line the eggs or the dots? The line is showing sort of the, the average. Yeah, you're good on the this. The dots are the eggs. The dots are the eggs, yeah. Okay, so uh, pro providing parental care what people love about these fish. Here's a dad. The mom's in the background. They're wonderful parents. They guard their kids and they'll guard them. Um, typically in the aquarium, maybe three weeks or so. And then after that, they start to lose interest. Got to be a little bit careful at that point if you want to keep the kids because once they start thinking about having another set of kids, it's a very quick transition from you're my kids and I love you to death to just to death. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll eat them. And it can happen overnight. It's like, no, yesterday we were defending them against everything, and today they're going to eat them all because they've got a new batch coming. It's very interesting. In fact, what it's one of the things that intrigues us is that there are some cichlids like this which do this because what would happen in the wild is the kids would, would go away. Uh, there's other cichlids, like if anyone's ever kept some of the brichardi from uh, Lake Tanganyika, the little princess cichlids, they keep multiple family levels together or the buffalo head cichlids, and the, the kids will take care of the next batch of kids, which is really cool. These guys don't do that. 
please don't do that. So um, we look at this, how much are they willing to take care of their kids with all sorts of experiments. I'm not going to talk about all of them. But what we do is we make these little models. I can tell you how to do it. It's very easy. You take a photograph, you, you, you cut it out, you, you print it on photographic paper, and you, you coat it with that sort of plasticky make your photos last forever stuff, put it on a little stick or something like that, and then you threaten parents with it. <laughs> it doesn't hurt them, but they, uh, they, they've got kids back here, and, and they bite them, and they bite these models, and you, and you can count it. It's just a wonderful thing to do, uh, to see them. It doesn't hurt them, and they, they bite them. And so the kinds of things that we have done, all sorts of experiments. So here's just a rundown of some of the things I, we've discovered over the years. So first of all, um, both parents provide parental care, so they're both very much involved. And interestingly, if you take one parent away, you take out the male, Female's fully capable of doing everything. She can take care of the eggs. She can do the guarding, everything like that. If you take out the female, the male is fully capable of doing everything and will do everything. He can take care of the eggs and he can guard them. So that's interesting. Often you don't see males normally do some of that stuff, but they're fully capable of doing it. Um, the amount that a parent cares depends on the number of offspring. We've done lots of experiments where we take babies away and change the number. Very, very clear. More babies there are, the more care they provide. Interesting. The amount of, of care changes as the fry get older. So uh, the day that they spawn, they care a little bit. In about eight, 10 days, they sort of reach a peak. And then they kind of like, yeah, we call this weaning, you know, it's like, yeah, you can do it, you can survive. We've done some really cool experiments as to, as, to, as to why it happens. And the bottom line is, it's not even just a calendar thing. They're not like counting time. They're actually evaluating the condition of the kids. And we can change this on them. And the, the, if you change it the right way, the, the, the parents will actually like, oh, these kids aren't doing very well. I think we're going to have to up our game and, and provide more care for longer. It's a little fish this big doing this stuff. It's remarkable, okay? Uh, a larger pair, parent will care less than a smaller parent. <coughs> That's interesting. And that gets back to that thing about how, what size of a male does a female want? Because if she chooses a really, really big male, he won't do anything. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's amazing. I've made these pairs with these little tiny one inch female and like a five inch male, and I threaten them with the model. And the male's like, whatever, I'm kind of busy. And she'll actually attack him. She'll bite him. It's like, get in the game, dude. Do something. It's like, I can't. And there's a whole bunch of theories as to why this is that we developed. But, but yeah, it's very, very interesting. Which is another segue to one of the things that we're working on right now. I don't know if anyone has any way to help us on this. One of my students, Anessa, who was going to be here, but she can't because uh, she was sick today. We want to measure how hard they bite. So we're always yeah. pushing the edges of technology. And we're, we're trying to develop, if anyone knows anything about this, what's called a force plate underwater where we can have the little fish bite it. And it'll show up on the screen, 9.2. And then another one bite it, you know, 6.4. So we're always messing with different technologies to try and understand things. Uh -huh. You could do like a picture of one of the babies so, and then like put the sensor thing like behind That's them. exactly what we're doing. We're going to put that. The trouble is getting the sensor to work underwater because it's electronic. Yeah. So you see we have a bit of a challenge there. Well, you Stuff that makes the that's right, stuff and that's what we're going to do. The trouble is, the more you code it, then you can't feel the bite. Oh. See, but maybe you'll solve this for us. Uh -huh. So this is what maybe next time we'll tell you. Okay, um, so yeah, there's just lots of interesting things that you can do with this. Uh, the the uh, the most recent. I'm not going to show you all those experiments. I will show you this experiment. We're just about at the end here. Um, what sometimes happens in the wild is you'll have a parents with their kids. They got their whole bunch of kids here and another pair of parents with their kids over here and they're swimming around because the kids are hard to control. You know, the kids are like that. The kids are going all over the place and the two groups will come together and then it's like, ah, <laughs> okay. And the two parents are looking at each other and they have to beat off the other parents because the other parents will eat their kids. No, no questions. They will eat those kids. So, we're very interested in what happens when two parents meet two parents. Do they like have a way of sorting this out? And so um, 
Colleen did this up here. You can't really see it, but what it is, it's one of those models with two fish attached to it. And so we had a pair of convicts, which we had to breed, and then we attacked them with a double model, one of which was a bigger one, and one of which was a smaller one. And what we were thinking, what we suspect from a, for a whole bunch of reasons, is that the big male should line up with the big predator, and the little female should line up with the little female. And it's exactly what happens. And it was beautiful to watch it. They'll even like switch places, like, oh, you got to get over there so that I can kind of get at him. And you do. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to watch. And I don't have good video of it. Um, but basically, what this says for the male, he's big. He bites the big model the most, and he bites the little model a little bit. The female is the opposite. She's small. She picks on the little model and leaves the big model alone. Isn't that incredible? All this stuff is going on in that fish tank that you're going to buy and set up with convict cichlids. <laughs> do they recognize their own babies? Like if you were to switch out babies? Yes. Size, yes, they do. I haven't done that work, but my friend Brian Wisenden has done that work. Okay, so they're wonderful fish, but they're pretty hardcore sometimes. What he has shown is that if you take parents that have a school of kids and then you mix in some other kids, if the other kids are um, about the same size, the parents are like, eh, not so sure. These might be ours, might not be. If the other kids are small, this is like Game of Thrones stuff, what they do. They push the little kids to the outside of the school to act as a live shield so that when predators eat they kill all the other babies first oh my God. <sighs> it's harsh it's a harsh world out there the parents the parents they don't kill them they push like here you be a you you be a shield isn't that wild so anyway last thing hot off the presses this is what the stuff we were doing in in uh, uh, this january just got back a few weeks ago in costa rica um, I talked about some of the relatives, uh, the Septifasciatus, and there's this thing, Myrne, and uh, this is uh, Costa Rica over here, and um, we're working on this part right down here, we're focusing on this, because what's so interesting is here's these two fish, this is the Septifasciatus, this is the Myrne, Myrne always has these horizontal stripes, other than that, they look very, very similar, same size, same breeding colors, everything, you can easily confuse them. Um, so here's this east side of Costa Rica, and what's interesting, let's see, is it here? Okay, I'll show you here. Here's Septum fasciatus. They're found in all these spots, and here's Myrne, and no one really knew what was going on there a few years ago, so we thought, what's going on? Do these two mix? They can breed with each other any day of the week in a fish tank. You put the two together, they'll breed with each other. And so we wanted to know, like, are these guys just here and these guys just there? And what we spent the last few years doing is finding little tiny creeks in the middle of the, of the jungle that are right in between these spots, looking to see is it the one species or is it the other species that's there. And so um, now let's just see if the odds of this working are zero, but let's see what happens here. Is it going to work? Oh. No? It didn't, the video didn't play? I don't know why it does that. It, I tried it before. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. It's just, um, hmm. No, it's not going to even go forward. So anyway, um, just north of this, there's the, the, the species without the stripes. And just south of it, there's a species with the stripes. And we now have them within five kilometers of each other. You could almost throw a rock from the one to the other. And we're interested, like, do they mix or do they not mix? And it appears like they don't mix. So my student Jacinda was in, down there in January, took all these photographs that right at this point north, it's all septum fasciatus. And just south of that, it's all Myrne. And um, our next step this coming year, we're going to do the genetic work to show are they actually hybridizing or not. Um, it's, it's, uh, it takes us to some very, very remote spots. Um, we are deep in the, in the rainforest. Sometimes on the road, sometimes on little trail things. Uh huh. Is there any other?
so there isn't so the the rivers think of the rivers as going like um like there's well they're like this going out into the ocean they're right next to each other okay and i'll show you it's also three-dimensional so it's not just flat and what it is i can't show you that either um so these are some of the rivers. The Rio Suri is the one that has uh, the Mirne in it. And uh, I'm not going to show you that. Um, I will show you this. One sec. Do you think the bodies of water connected at some point in the past? No. Um, well, possibly because of flooding. Right. Um, let's see if I can get this guy. Da, 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 da. No, actually, I'm just going to leave it there because the video is not working. Um, what we're doing now is we're using 3D printers to make three-dimensional topographic maps to show that while the rivers are next to each other, there's a ridge of mountains in between. And they, they actually go like this, where they're interdigitated, but the fish can't go over the mountains to get to each other. You could almost throw one from one to the other, but they're separated. So this is why there's these two species. Anyway, that is the end of what I've got. Thank you. So, yeah. uh -huh. Go ahead.